Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm sure we'll continue to have folks join in. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Liberty and uh, I'm part of the Firestorm Collective. Um, we are a 16-year-old uh, uh, cooperative uh, bookstore here in Asheville, North Carolina on the land of the Cherokee people. And tonight we're really excited, uh, and I'm excited uh, to be here hosting a conversation on trauma, tresses, and truth. Uh, with editor uh, Lizette Wanzer in conversation with Valerie Carpenter and Barbara Ruth Saunders. Uh, they're going to be talking about the status of Black women's hair, natural hair, at the intersection of racial justice and Black feminism. Um, so Firestorm, if you've never been here before or joined in one of our other events, um, is uh, a bookstore in Southern Appalachia, um, we strive to feature events, uh, both in person and online, um, that reflect both our interests uh, as, a, as a collective and also um, the interests and needs of marginalized communities in the South particularly. Um, we are continuing to do uh, a fair number of events online, uh, both because we know that there's a lot of folks in our community for whom in-person events are have some accessibility challenges, whether that's because of COVID or other things. Um, and also because we get an opportunity to connect with authors um, and audience at a distance, uh, which is a real treat, uh, which is the situation tonight. So uh, if you're interested in our events, um, I would definitely encourage you to sign up for our newsletter or follow us on social media, where we generally post uh, at least anything virtual um, and a lot of our in-person content as well. Um, just to give you a little peek uh, on a couple upcoming topics, uh, on Tuesday, we'll be hosting a virtual event with two historians, Charlie Allison and Zoe Baker, uh, who are going to discuss anarchism at the dawn of the 20th century. And then in late April, I'm really excited um, about having contributors to Deviant Hollers, uh, who are going to talk about queerness and settle, uh, settler colonialism uh, in Appalachia. Uh, so definitely put those on your calendar and check out ours. So a little note about tonight, uh, we are using Zoom's um, webinar uh, feature. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, the primary way to engage with the panelists tonight is gonna be using the Q&A tool, which you can probably find at the bottom of your screen. So if you find yourself with questions uh, at any point throughout the evening, I hope that you'll uh, write those out in the Q&A tool and submit them. We're gonna set aside a little bit of time at the end of the night uh, to kind of dip into those audience questions. Um, and I know the panelists will appreciate um, having uh, uh, hearing from you. So let's get started. Uh, Lizette Wanzer's work uh, appears in over 30 literary journals, books, and magazines. A library journal named Trauma, Trusses, and Truth, a top 10 best social sciences book, Publishers Weekly, featured the book in fall 2022. Lizette is a contributor to Lyric Essays as Resistance, uh, Truth from the Margins, Civil Liberties United, Diverse Voices, and the San Francisco Bay Area, and the multi-award winning The Chalk Circle Intercultural Prize winning Essays. Trauma, Tresses, and Truth was a 2023 Black History Month selection of the Black Women's Studies Association. Valerie Carpenter serves in the capacity of Deputy Manager of Family and Community Affairs with uh, Serving Our Children. She has 10 years of experience in the education system, working in admissions and recruitment. Valerie is a 2020 graduate, graduate of the uh, University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service and is currently enrolled as a doctoral student at Northeastern University's Law and Public uh, and policy program where she's writing a dissertation on homelessness. Barbara Ruth Saunders is a writer, editor, and writing coach. She works as a technical writer, leads workshops on process and craft, and writes poetry and memoir. The core of her work is helping smart people write effectively and with more ease by focusing their attention on the stage of the process uh, where thoughts become words. Uh, she's at work on Dead Dreams, an account of following the Grateful Dead, and she chopped off her relaxed hair in 1994 and hasn't cut her hair since Jerry Garcia died. Um, welcome to all of you. It's such a pleasure to have you here um, today. 
Uh, and I know there's going to be a fantastic conversation. I'm going to go ahead and pass off to you, uh, Lizette. Thank you. Thank you, Liberty. And welcome, everyone, to Trauma, Tresses, and Truth. Um, as Liberty said, I'm Lizette Wander. I'm an author, a writing coach, and professional development instructor for creative writers. I'm based in San Francisco, although I'm originally from New York. The book, Trauma, Tresses, and Truth, uh, officially launched in November of 2022. In this book, I've curated a collection of essays and poetry uh, written by Afro-Latina and African-American women who are in one form or another interrogating the perception, the policing, the persecution, and the politics, so four Ps, of Black women's natural hair in American society. So you might wonder, well, why did, why did you decide to do this book? So let me back up a little bit. Um, I have proposed a creative nonfiction panel on the topic of natural hair for AWP's 2020 conference, which occurred in San Antonio and it occurred in March of 2020. So this is right before um, all of the lockdowns started happening and before people started realizing that um, COVID was not something that was gonna be around for a couple of months and then be gone. So, uh, it was already kind of a frantic and fraught time. Some of you who are writers have probably attended uh, AWP one year or another. And you know how tough it is to get a panel accepted there. It's very competitive. So I had applied many times before without any luck. But this time, uh, when I was at AWP in 2019, which was in Portland, Oregon, I actually attended a session there called how do you create a competitive proposal for AWP? So I had envisioned a panel where um, Black and Black Latina women would share narratives about the scarring experiences we had endured during our lives because we'd chosen to wear our hair natural or to go natural, to, to transition to natural. Um, and so I recruited four other women for this proposal and AWP accepted this one. Uh, so all five of us got there and we read our essays that we had written. Um, and all four of those uh, women have work in the book, by the way. Uh, and then at our session's close, which was standing room only, pretty big room, uh, six women approached me from the audience, six audience members, and asked me where they could buy the book. And there was no book. They said, well, you're not selling it up here. Uh, on the table. So is it down in the book fair? Is that where we should go? And of course, there wasn't any book. And while I was flattered, I didn't think that their idea had any legs as a book at that time. I was like, well, who's going to be interested in this topic uh, other than an individual essay or two? And then just shortly after, remember, this was March 2020. So shortly after, uh, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd happened. And during that late spring and then through the summer, um, I remember my rage kind of crusting into a monstrosity that I barely recognized. So it wasn't just anger, it was qualitatively and quantitatively diff different than just anger. Um, so I just remember waking up angry or in rage and going to sleep in rage. Um, and my days were just fraught with very unhealthy, unrelieved, gavel to gavel fury and it leaked into my everyday functioning and it compromised um, everything I mean it was hard to work I couldn't eat I wasn't sleeping well and then having the coronavirus lockdown uh, exacerbated the situation and then here in San Francisco when the protest started we also were one of the first cities to institute a curfew so all of that just exacerbated um, my emotions and I felt pretty impotent despite going on marches and demonstrations and so on. But the one weapon that I knew I could wail because I was a writer was my writing. So it dawned on me that, you know, the surveillance and the persecution and all of the attacks on our natural hair, that natural hair bias is another form of policing and another form of persecution of the black body. 
and also a, another attempt at erasure of um, the black body. So while during that summer, I call it the summer of racial reckoning, um, that summer of 2020, with all the upheavals going on, while organizations were hurrying to establish equity seminars and everybody was having um, you know, diversity trainings and they were plastering solidarity platitudes all over their websites. Um, and as our then president admonished white supremacists to stand back and stand by, I started writing my book proposal that July. I took the whole month to write it. And then when July was finished, basically around the 30th or the 31st, I thought, well, you finished the proposal, you do feel better. You have metabolized some of that rage, but since you finished it, go ahead and send it out. I didn't expect it to get any takers, but I figured the most fitting way to cap a book proposal is to go ahead and you know send it out, get a few rejections, and then you can call it a day. Uh, however, by the end of September, uh, I had four publishing offers and one agent offer. So I like to tell audiences that I'm 100% convinced, and I still am, that that sort of response would not have happened during any other year. So not in 2019 and not in 2021. So in some ways, this book tapped into the zeitgeist that was going on that summer. And it really was a response to the national um, upheaval, or really the worldwide, as it turned out, upheaval of the summer of 2020. So the essays in this book, they're all first person accounts. They're all true stories. There are four sections of the book. Each section opens with a poem, but after the poem, then it's, it's essays. And all of the essays provide a lens into how and why and the various manners in which the black body remains misread and misunderstood through the lens of our natural hair. And I feel that particularly relevant during this time of emboldened white supremacy um, that surged after the 2016 election and during this time of emboldened racism and provocative othering that uh, this work explores how writing about one of the still remaining systemic biases in our schools and in academia and in corporate America might lead to greater understanding and respect. So this work pushes for identities without apologies. The book is also tied to another project that I helm, which is a virtual conference also called Trauma, Chesses, and Truth, uh, colon, virtual conference interrogating black women's natural hair. So I produced the inaugural version of that conference in the summer of 2021. And it was a two day conference then I then got funding to produce it again last summer. And it was a three-day conference then by um, popular demand. So I recruited uh, panelists, speakers, authors, and leaders to participate in that conference. So what this conference features, it's virtual. Uh, so you can tune in from anywhere. And it features presentations, workshops, keynoters, webinars, and author readings um, throughout the schedule. Uh, I did have... I did receive funding last year to produce one again this year. So it's happening this year, uh, August 9th to the 11th. And a call for submissions is open if you are interested in submitting. Uh, it closes on April 12th. So you've got a few days left to submit um, for that. And a call for submission is open on my website. And also I think Liberty has put the link for it. Yes, in the uh, chat. Uh, if you're interested. And you can also contact me through my website if you have more questions about um, the conference before you submit uh, an application for that. Uh, you can apply for a panelist position or a webinar position. The workshop leader positions are all filled at this time. Um, and unusual for this type of conference, there is an honorarium if you're accepted. And if you want to just ex uh, attend the conference, and not present at it, then you can contact me through my website to get added to the early bird notification list. So like many of us here, um, not just on the panel, but in, in the audience as well, I am concerned with promoting cultural equity and social and political justice. And so that's what these two projects do, the book and the conference. My hope 
for this work is that this work, that my efforts will move the needle on passing the bill for a national federal crown act. Okay, right now we have a patchwork quilt of states that have and do not have a crown act. So in states where you're protected, that's great. But suppose I were to go to a state that doesn't have a Crown Act enacted, they could legally make a job offer to me contingent upon my cutting or taking out my dreadlocks and straightening my hair. So I would not be protected in those states. There are also states that have uh, specific jurisdictions inside of the states, like a particular city that has the Crown Act and the rest of the state doesn't. So you are protected within the bounds of that municipality, but not in the rest of the state. So it's very bizarre. Um, we have introduced the Crown Act at the national level twice, and it keeps getting uh, shut down in the Senate. So it's once again been introduced by Senator Cory Booker, and um, we're, we're trying to see what, what happens there. So that's what I'm hoping that this, this work will do. All right. Uh, the book does have a study guide and a resource guide in the back. It has been course adopted at a number of universities, the most recent one being uh, Franklin Marshall College in Pennsylvania. It's also being taught at San Jose State University and at University of Dayton in Ohio and State University of New York in Albany. Okay, and then it's under consideration at Bemidji University in, in Minnesota and Santa Clara University, which is um, down on a peninsula here in the Bay Area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a few selections from uh, my first essay in the book, which is called Toward Decolonizing Our Roots. And I'm going to read a series of vignettes, and then I'll um, jump back to some of the more critical or analytical parts of the essay. This is the first one called, called Toward Decolonizing Our Roots. I just want to show you that each essay does open with a sketch of a natural hairstyle. And the artist is Sal Steiner, who is San Francisco based. And these drawings all call, come from his um, art collection called Headscapes. It was just my third day on the job. I was still learning to use the fax machine, a newfangled contraption that everyone in the office viewed with diffident deference. The company was small, comprising eight employees. Coworkers had taken me out for lunch on my first day, minus one team member who had been on vacation. As Irene and I, Irene was my assistant at, at this time. And the other thing you need to know is that at this time I was wearing uh, Casamance braids. As Irene and I were tinkering with the recalcitrant printer, this coworker who had been on vacation when I started, knocked on our door and walked in. A portly man in his late thirties with a shock of russet curls and spotting a bright white shirt and a polished silver watch, he came over to introduce himself with a nut cracking handshake. I returned to my desk and politely inquired about his vacation. We made small talk, then business speak, back to small talk. Only so much to be said about the weather, the traffic, and the mayor. A column of silence rose between us. His gaze alighted on my head. How did you get your hair like that? He reached across my desk and ran all five fingers of his right hand through my shoulder length braids. I seized his arm mid-arc, gripped it just hard enough to signal my spirit, and knocked it away with a fist. I stared at him, letting a new foul silence shroud us for several seconds. Three quarters of letting a lance hit its target is timing. If you want to touch my hair, I said, you ask first. And when you do ask, I'll say no. Shock and puzzlement leaped through his features. I read the question marks and a flash of apprehension in his eyes. He flushed several shades of red, pivoted, exited. Do you wash those? 
She, a fellow strap hanger, blonde, on New York's uptown Lexington Avenue Express. Although we didn't know one another, we waited in the same area of the subway platform each morning and often wound up riding together, exchanging nods and smiles. Watch what? Your braids. I wrinkled my brow and tilted my head, affecting a perplexed posture. I was wearing dreadlocks at the time. These aren't braids. Yeah, they are. No, they're not. What do you call them? Dreads? Dreads? As in dreadlocks. Do you wash them? Of course I wash them. It's my hair. You wash yours, don't you? I didn't know you were Rasta. I didn't either. Thanks for enlightening me. I'm in my high school's infirmary. My math teacher dispatched me there in the middle of class when she noticed sweat beads jeweling my face. I sit in a small room, marveling that though I'm in a clinic, the room is devoid of any semblance of care or comfort. The chair's metal legs are cold, a gadget in one corner beeps, an array of menacing devices hang along the far wall, and a stench of illness and caustic cleansers rinses over me. Outdoors, the temperature is in the 70s, but in here, I'm wearing two sweaters and shivering. My throat is blazing. My skin is clammy. I'm sporting a jerry curl, but can't even feel the juicy locks lapping my forehead. The nurse standing over me in unrelieved white, including wavy white hair and a crisp nurse's hat, asks me to describe my symptoms. I tell her my head feels like a melting candle with a low wick. Shadows of bafflement and astonishment scud across her face. The school, predominantly white and private, has a bucolic campus, a dress code, a swimming pool, no graffiti, and a two-hour entrance, entrance exam. I've seen that phased look on faculty faces. Instructors were faculty here, not merely teachers. Directed at me numerous times in the school's Spartan classrooms. I know what the look means, and I normally take a little wicked pleasure in their shock at my precise creative diction, but I'm too sick to care. The nurse inserts a thermometer under my tongue and stands beside my chair as we wait. All I want to do is slide into one of the infirmary beds and go to sleep. I feel a sudden pressure in the center of my scalp, a series of dabs. I tilt my head up to see the nurse leaning over my hair with an expression of wonder, her mouth slightly ajar, her eyebrows arched. I slide down in the chair to ease away from her pawing. She laughs warmly and says, I just had to touch it. We're in New York, but a Southern accent coats her syllables. She withdraws the thermometer and declares I have a fever of 101. I tell her I want to call my mom and go home. I want to tell my mom I need to return to public school. Though I'd worn various braided styles and TWAs, teeny weeny afros, ever since the time, uh, ever since the 1990s, I'd worn dreadlocks for the past eight years. One month ago, as I was walking my dog in my San Francisco neighborhood, I passed a white man draped in scruffy, loose garments. His eyes followed me as I walked past him. When I reached the middle of the block, he called out, I like your snakes. They're really pretty. Since only I, he, and my dog were on the block at the moment, I knew he was addressing me. I ignored him. My dog stopped to do his business. As I scooped it up in a doggy bag and walked on, the man called out again in rapid fire speech to my retreating back. Your snakes, I really like them. They're so neat, I like the color. I felt the involuntary dip in the center of my tongue that perennially preceded an obscenity laced remark issuing from my mouth. By the grace of God, I checked my spleen. I didn't acknowledge the man. I continued strolling with my dog, no slower and no faster than before, and turned the corner. 
From grammar in high schools to corporate boardrooms and military squadrons, Black and Afro-Latina natural hair continues to confound, transfix, and enrage members of white American society. Why is this still the case? Why have we not moved beyond that perennial racist emblem? And why are women so disproportionately affected? Why does our hair become most palatable when it capitulates and has been subjugated to resemble Caucasian traits as closely as possible? Who in our society gets to offer the prevailing constitution of professional appearance? How do we, as Black women and men as well, encourage, encourage course correction and alter the prism through which our hair is interrogated? Which differences make a difference and when? The 2016 Perception Institute survey of Black and white women found that although the majority of both black and white respondents exhibited bias against natural hair, white women showed explicit bias against women who wear natural hairstyles, while one in five black women feel social pressure to straighten their hair for work, twice as many as white women. One concept to bear in mind when considering the aforementioned questions I posed is this. Hierarchies marked by race are ideologically inflected ways of enforcing the majority culture's status quo. It's essential to realize that white American society hasn't had to live as racialized beings, making it difficult for that sector to acknowledge race as an inherent part of systems. Mainstream American society considers whiteness to be the typified barometer. The Caucasian standard is implicitly the baseline against which all other standards are measured. And this is precisely the type of metric that problematizes our natural hair. In his book, Slavery and Social Death, Harvard sociologist Orlando Patterson says, quote, hair type rapidly became the real symbolic badge of slavery. Although, like many powerful symbols, it was disguised, in this case, by the linguistic device of using the term black, which nominally threw the emphasis to color. No one who has grown up in a multiracial society, however, is unaware of the fact that hair difference is what carries the real symbolic potency, unquote. So Kile Kamara would recap recapitulate his perspective nearly 30 years later, saying, quote, hair like skin color is a social marker that distinguishes blacks from others and has essentially functioned as a way to position some outside the sanctified realm of beauty and acceptance since slavery, unquote. And the language in California's Crown Act concretized both Patterson's and Kamara's sentiments, saying in part, in a society in which hair has historically been one of many determining factors of a person's race and of whether they were a second-class citizen, hair today remains a proxy for race. Therefore, hair discrimination, targeting hairstyles associated with race is racial discrimination. And I will close with this, um, the closing bookend to the opening scene with my coworker. For weeks, my coworker distanced himself from me until the day we boarded the same crowded elevator. Our eyes met across the grid of heads and hats and helmets. Neither of us blinked. He gave a small nod, small smile, touched the brim of his derby. I nodded back, sad smile. When we alighted, we walked single file in silence. As we passed the vending machine, he spoke. Nice day today. Yes, it is. It's supposed to rain tomorrow. Is it? What do you make of Giuliani's plan for Times Square? I think it sucks. I agree. It'll turn the place into a six flags for tourists. I hope not. Worse than the Vegas Strip. I guess we'll find out soon enough. Well, here we are, 
Another day, another dollar. He dashed ahead to open the door for me. Appreciate it. You bet. Isn't today the building's ice cream social? Think so. You going? He spoke to my back as I headed for my office. Maybe. Depends how much work I get done. I'm going. I slid the key into my door lock. Might be a good way for you to meet other tenants in the building. That's a thought. I turned the knob. Well, have a good one. You too. I shut my door. Thank you. So Valerie and Barbara, are you ready for the first question? All right, here we go. Let's see, there's so many good ones here. Um, oh, this one. In what ways does hair bias constitute a form of not garden variety injustice, but specifically systemic injustice? How is hair bias different from just run of the mill injustice and it, specific, it demonstrates specifically systemic injustice? Uh, I'll start with um, uh, something that probably doesn't affect me as much now as it, as it affected me when I was younger, but uh, even just the cost, mm. the cost of maintaining hair in a certain way. So it's if um, I can remember spending $60 uh, every six weeks, eight weeks, which was a lot of money. For me um and that requirement i think it, it's just another one i mean we talked you talked before about um this it affecting women and so if it's like the makeup and the clothes and the pantyhose and the dry cleaning and then on top of that the hair mm -hmm. so that's one of them mm -hmm. if, if that's what it takes to get a job or yeah can you repeat that question for me one more time? Was that? Yep. Um, and thank you, Liberty, for putting the headscapes in. You found it. Um, by Sal Steiner. He he has put that in the um they put that in the chat. If you you are interested in seeing more of Sal Steiner's work. Uh so in what ways does hair bias constitute a form of not garden variety, but systemic injustice? Mm. Oh, that's a, uh... and I'm trying to think about mine now. I mean, I, I too have locks, so, you know, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, um... I'd have to agree. Um, I've always been one self-sufficient to pretty much do my own hair mm -hmm. and going into the natural phase and embracing my natural hair, a lot of people think it's easier and it's not. Um, it's definitely more work. I feel like you have to put into it more products that you want to try. Mm -hmm. um, so I I was a product junkie um, when I first went natural. I purchased just like everything because I didn't know what worked for my hair. It was so many years since I had been natural. Um, so for me, it buying all these unnecessary things I didn't need now going to get it maintenance on a regular um, is very costly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely the upkeep is, is expensive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's systemic injustice because this hair bias doesn't seem to affect anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it's kind of a proxy, a sneaky backdoor proxy war for racism in general, because I don't see this, uh, I don't see 
people of other races being asked to change their hair or being told that it's unprofessional unless they change it. Um, and so it's it's specific, I feel, to black and brown people uh, who have textured hair. And I think that that's what, what makes it systemic as opposed to garden variety injustice, which, you know, it, it exists alongside that. But I think what makes it systemic is that it's it's weaponized against us uh, specifically. All right, I'm tossing another one to you. Oh, I like this one. I was visiting a college last week um, doing some author events, and I tossed this out to the students uh, and got some interesting responses. So I want to hear what you two think. Um, does the Crown Act, does it truly, and I should explain for those who are not familiar with it, Crown stands for, um, it's a synonym for the hair on our heads. It's also kind of a, a synonym for queendom, right? We, we are queens but it's also an acronym and it stands for creating a respectful and open uh, world or workplace for natural hair. Okay, so uh, discuss whether the Crown Act truly aligns with American values. Um, looking beyond the legislation's language to its possible applications. So yes, it's protective legislation, but does it truly align with American values? Now I know what I think, but I'm not gonna say anything. I don't believe it does. I mean, I, I see it as a start. You know, it's something that they're getting in writing, but no, it doesn't align with um, American values, not American values for black people. Uh -huh. Maybe the American values for other races, but not for uh -huh. Um, I think it is, it almost acts as something to say, you know, we need to get something on the books to kind of hush them up. And, <laughs> and <laughs> that's just kind of how I feel about, about the Crown Act, you know, it, and I think it would be great because again, so many people go into their workplace being told to change their hair or, or they're sent home. So many kids are going to these schools and they're being told, well, you can't graduate, you can't walk. Uh, yeah. Even though you're uh, the salutatorian or valedictorian, but your hair is a problem. Mm -hmm. So, no, it doesn't represent our American values at all. We're supposed to be, you know, liberty, freedom. You know, we have our freedom of speech. But how can I have a freedom of speech? You know, I, it may not be what I want to say, but how I want to represent myself. Mm -hmm. And it's not and you're taking it away from me. You're stripping that away from me because you feel my look is untamed or it is just not what the American look should be. So no, it, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you have the Crown Act by you? We don't. Not yet. Really? Mm -mm. I think Maryland is either getting trying to get it or they just recently. Virginia okay. maybe, but I'm in Maryland. Okay. I think Virginia has it. Yeah. Yeah, I think they got it. Okay. I would say, I think, um, unfortunately, it's a kind of a whack-a-mole <laughs> against, um, it, like, you shouldn't have to go specifically after, okay, that bodily op autonomy thing applies to Black people too, but it, but we are trying to play whack-a-mole with a value that, you know, America espouses and maybe plays lip service to, but um, so it does align with American values, but the fact of having to do it in that yeah. way uh, reveals a little, reveals a problem. So th those are the responses I got from the students. And it was literally like one half of the room said, yes, it does align because it's the American way to pass legislation to protect people. But the other half said, well, the American way shouldn't require this legislation in the first place. Um, and so I'm inclined to think, uh, to lean in that direction, that just the fact that we need to have it at all is un-American. If 
we're going to really believe what America is supposed to be, then, you know, we shouldn't even need this legislation. We shouldn't even need a Crown Act. Um, but we do. We need it. And we, sh we shouldn't. So I feel like, no, that it doesn't align with um, American values. Barbara, what do you want to say? I was just thinking, um, I was thinking about what you said earlier. Um, I have actually seen people, other people be fired or, you know, penalized for their hair. Mm -hmm. But I think the difference is it's not so widespread. So um, I worked at a place where a young kind of hip white guy with a long hair mm -hmm. was really kind of... Um, harassed by a new manager that came in and but what happened was he just left and got another job somewhere else because it was not it wasn't so widespread that it, you needed a, a law right right uh -huh. interesting um i've also been asked whether the crown act covers head coverings and i've read the whole act and at least here in california i have not seen anything in there about protecting head coverings um you know, because some of us like to wear, you know, G clays or turbans or wraps and so on. Um, and so let's say I went to work one day wearing one of those, would I have recourse if they said you have to take that off? It's not professional. I don't know. Well, and I, I guess with that too, I think about, you know, black women are one of the leading groups with alopecia. So what if I am trying to cover up, you know, something that I have as far as, you know, and now I'm being asked, it's, it's, an, it's embarrassing. It's, you know, something I don't, I feel like I shouldn't have to explain because I want to wear my hair covered because I'm right. going through, you know, something with a scalp condition. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I don't, it, it should be, if, if not, it really should be looked into to let people wear mm -hmm. their hair coverings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, I was watching TV and this um, journalist, she was on there and she had just been wearing like different wigs and different uh -huh. coverings. And finally, all of a sudden, she just said one day she was just going to go without it. And she went in, she was completely bald and everybody was just looking like, oh, what happened? Did you cut your hair? And she was like, no, I've been going through this condition, but I've always felt so embarrassed and I didn't want anybody, you know, asking me all these questions. She's like, but no, I have, I have a scalp condition. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, but to even have to go through the motion of preparing yes. people for that is crazy mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Crazy. Yep. Interesting. All right. Another one. Uh, let's see. Mm. Oh. How about this one? In the 1960s, the Afro hairstyle came to represent the Black is Beautiful motto and the civil rights movement. Does the message of I am not my hair conflict with using hair to demonstrate political beliefs and make social change? Hmm. So we've had some songs about I am not my hair. We've had some poems about it. Yeah. Does that conflict? with using hair to demonstrate political beliefs. It does. Um, and although I love the song by NDRE, I, I'm against that. I, I feel like my hair, even, even the smallest thing, it makes up a lot of me. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it dates back to our ancestry, you know, mm -hmm. 1700s when Black people or black women were forced to cut their hair or where black people were forced to cover their hair through the Tignan yeah. law because yeah. white men would, you know, find that they were attractive and the white women would get jealous. So for me, it is, it's so much embedded in us and how our hair can represent our wealth, our culture, mm -hmm. yes. um, back in the day, the tribe that you came yep. from. Um, so marriage status. Yes. Your marriage status. Um, people would know your age. Yep. you know, based on how it is. And also the way black people would style their hair, um, you know, doing different type of patterns and cornrows that would let, you know, them know through communication, this is going to be yep. our roadmap of how we are going to try to escape or what road yep. we're going to travel through. So it's deeper for me than, yep. you know, just saying I am not my hair. I, mm -hmm. It's a big part of me. 
I remember when I was, I started to lose some locks and I was like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? Like, and it really took a toll on me yeah. mm -hmm. because I do, I, I find that my hair is a precious part of me. Um, and I think too, for a lot of black women, that's kind of how we feel. It's, it's growing each strand growing from my head and mm -hmm. how it's, it's more than, you know, what a lot of people think, you know, again, you use the demonstration that people touch it on your hair to them. It's no big deal, but for us, yeah. it's like, you've just touched my crown, my glory, yes. you know, mm -hmm. and it, it does, you know, it, for me, it touches near and dear to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, and a lot of people do not know that, um, slaves braided escape routes and messages into their hair um mm -hmm. kind of like a little secret hieroglyphics um yeah. and valerie for people who are not familiar with the tinian laws can you just explain a little bit about that for listeners who have not heard of them before in louisiana oh yeah let me i have it up um so the tinian law which was in the late 18th century in louisiana uh black women were banned from wearing their hair out in public um, and they were ordered to uh, wear scarves or, you know, something to cover up their hair. Um, and this was because they wanted to curb the growing influence of the free Black population and keep the social order. Um, mm -hmm. So also during that time, like I said, it was also that some of the Black women who, you know, would just show their hair, it was drawing attention of the white men um, and the their white counterparts would feel, you know, jealous. And so they wanted them to cover up not really so they would be looked at in a, a pleasant yep. way. Yep. Yep. And then we have found a way to reclaim even that. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Wow. <laughs> making it cute, making the hair. That's right. right. <laughs> yep. All these different styles that you can do with it, um, the different fabrics, uh, all of that, which we've we found a way to reclaim even that. Mm -hmm. And and also too, you know, with some of the cornrows and the braiding. Um, it was a means of survival. So, you know, when the women would be able to put little um, rice seeds. or seeds in yes. there yes. through the scalp and they would braid it. That way, yep. as they were traveling, trying to get away, they had a food supply. So, yep. Yep. again, just creative and, you know, using all those techniques. I mean, how can you not be proud of your hair or your ancestry? Yep. <laughs> yep. And this texture will hold those seeds and that yep. right on. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I was going to answer the question about the political statement. Yes. The difference, uh, the hard thing about a political statement is that the recipient of the statement has to know what the statement is. So it's the same thing with uh, like the essay that you just read where the man said, oh, or the woman said, I didn't know you were Rasta or whatever. I mean, on the other hand, there are people who are Rastas. So right. it's hard and they are making a statement with their yes. hair. So yes. Whatever statement a person might choose to make who knows what other people may take you know in good faith or bad faith yes mm -hmm. yes um and i have had other you know especially black men assume that i am rasta um i have had that and i've had uh, white people who wear dreadlocks come up to me and say things like we're a part of an interesting community aren't we and uh, I'm like, well, what what community are you talking about? Um, all kinds of assumptions being made or that I'm militant mm -hmm. or that I'm angry um, because I'm wearing dreadlocks specifically. And right. I did not get those same interpretations when I was wearing braids. But right. now I am, you know, an angry black woman all the time and. I'm militant and unfriendly and blah, blah, blah. Well, I, I get the attention of usually Black men with the dreadlocks who are Rastas. Yes. Um, from their clothes and the things that they're wearing, or they're yeah. least Caribbean. And then um, when I went back to college, I, I did not have dreadlocks when I was in college. And I just straightened my hair. Okay. But I was just a hippie. And But when I go back and I look at the kids... Mm -hmm. young enough to be my children who are white who are in that same group mm -hmm. of hippies that live in the same houses and wear the same clothes and are vegetarian they have dreadlocks so it's a it's a political state yes. or maybe not a political statement but that's um they would interpret it in a different way they don't assume right. rasta for example right, right? 
Right. Yep. Yep. Some appropriation um going on there as as well. So does anyone know where the dreadlock hairstyle actually came from? Which culture? Um Yes. I think I do. What? I thought I did. Um no, no cheating. I see you looking it up. No, yeah, cheating. Well, no, no, no. I it, no. it's in my presentation. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, it was in my presentation. But I, from what I had, was the Gorilla Warriors. But you know, dreadlocks. They came uh -huh. from that movement. <laughs> the Gorilla Warriors. Mm hmm. It's actually from India. Ooh. The Sadhu. They wore them first. The Sadhu. Mm -hmm. They wore them for, yep. Wow. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to turn the floor over to you two, um, if you want to speak or present a bit from your presentations or give a talk or ask questions. Okay. I fluffed my gums enough. There is a question here in the box, a Q and A. No, for you, for you to ask questions. Okay, so how can a salon professional make natural hair services equitable for the guests who own natural hair? Curly haircuts often cost more than a straight haircut, but is a haircut a haircut? Are you asking that? Yeah, this was in the chat. Oh, you asked from the Q&A. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Uh... Equitable for the guests who own natural. So I'm assuming this is uh, a, either a multiracial or a, a white salon. Okay. Um, well, I, I would have hmm. a, like, my. Would I take a stab at it, Barbara? Yeah, <laughs> my response a couple things is that like black hair salons usually. Uh, do the gamut, right? Like, because there are black people who have straight hair. And so um, those hairstylists know how to do all those different versions of hair. And I don't know if they charge more or less, you know, for curly straight hair, because part of it is just, you know, how long does it take to do the yes. hair? Something? Yes. And right. How it, it's centered on the worker and the amount of work that something takes. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is um, a structural thing, right? Mm -hmm. Are you gonna charge, or do you have a hair salon in Berkeley, California? And it's like, oh, that hair is a hundred dollars more. That's mm -hmm. a different thing. Yes, yeah. I would I would say there's probably some room for both of them. And I might look, I might look to those hair salons, like a black hair salon in a place like where I grew up in New York. Uh -huh. They probably, you know, do the gamut of different kinds mm -hmm. of people's hair. Mm -hmm. That's and, a very good point. Um, I would even think or maybe suggest, I know a lot of places here um, in the DMV area, what they do is they'll have you come washed and blow dried like before. Uh -huh. So maybe that'll take a little time from, you know, what you need to do. Um, where you just you're doing strictly the cut they've already prepped their hair you know and, and managed it maybe that's something that you can you know offer same prices but just have them do the pre-work if it's too much of a you know a hassle for you uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah I mean my sister and I we always went to a black owned salon or a Puerto Rican owned salon mm -hmm. um, and my mom wouldn't let anyone else <laughs> Put their hands in our hair um i do have a friend who used to get her hair done at um what was it was it kmart that used to have or maybe it was target that used to have like in-store salons or something it's one of those types of stores and every time she would go there she would wait for the black stylist to become available and it was a white male stylist who said i know how to do this hair i've been trained in it i know how to do it let me try it and she was like scared to let him in her hair but she did it once and he did a fantastic job 
Um, but that is that is not the norm. So all all salons are supposed to be able to do all kinds of hair. Everyone should be able to go to any salon and get their hair done. But we know that that's not the case. We know we can't do that. Um, and we've all, I'm sure, heard stories from friends and so on who went and their hair started falling out or, um, you know, their ends started breaking or what have you, because the cosmetology schools really do not spend a lot of curriculum time on textured hair, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which is which is interesting. And then, you know, I met a sister who is married to someone in the armed services and they're stationed in Japan. And she said there's a whole cottage industry there of Japanese women who have been trained to do black women's hair. So they can do the braids, they can do the they can do the relaxer if you want that. They can do um, you know, a straw set, they can do sister locks, they can do dreadlocks. Wow. And there's a whole school and everything to train Japanese women to service the women on the military bases, the black women on a military bases. Um so where there's a will, there's a way, apparently. And it's yeah. of a stigma to it. Like it's just uh -huh. a business and it's not yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, okay, let's see. Madison, um, she, they says, they're an 18 year old cosmo cosmetologist and curl specialist. I feel hair discrimination and lack of knowledge is systemic. The cosmetology industry in the US was established in the 1920s. Uh, curl and natural hair care has not been part of the curriculum, yep or any area people need education in to become licensed professionals. Well, that is true. I'll finish the question, but I have something to say about that. Um, basically saying our hair isn't worthy of being deemed professional. Think of how a lot of braiders don't go to school because there's nothing beyond relaxers and hot presses that's being taught. Louisiana became the first state to require curl hair knowledge to become licensed two to three years ago. Hmm. New York becoming the second state just a few months ago. Uh, there's still 48 other states that do not require curl knowledge. Yeah, that's true, to become a hair professional. That's true. Um, it's also true, though, that some of that requirement to get certified is oppressive because a lot of styling is generational knowledge that has just been passed down from generation to generation. Um, and, you know, we know how to do it. And we don't really need a license to do it. People, you know, did the whole neighborhood in their garage, for example, um, or in their dorm room. Um, so there's there's an interesting, yes, everyone should know how to do this hair. And yes, they should be certified in it. Um, but what about women who've been doing this for generations out of their dining rooms or out of their garages? Um, and who aren't certified, what happens to them? Um, so very interesting that it's so recent. And a little, little disheartening. Uh, that was a statement from Madison. And then we have a question from Tiff Underwood. Uh, so yeah, there's a movement of teaching all types of natural hair instead of just straight hair in the beauty schools. Will we be addressing this in combination with the Crown Act? I am not a part of that. I'm really focused on getting a national, federal level Crown Act. Um, but what are your your ladies' thoughts about that? Um. And should there be a required certification across the board? I think there's two there are two pieces. I mean, it sounds like there are two pieces. One is whether the people who are certified to do hair in general should be required to have this mm -hmm. knowledge. And the mm -hmm. other is, should this knowledge require a license or right. certification? Yes. I think those two are kind of separate questions that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a nurse knows how to put on a Band-Aid, but anybody can put on a Band-Aid. So, <laughs> right, it's part of the curriculum. So I think it probably should be part of the curriculum. Like you should, you should learn, if you're in the United States, you should 
learned how to do all different kinds of hair that, yeah. people, that people have. Mm -hmm. um, if you, but at the same time, I mean, the certification is really about safety. That's what it's for. It's using harsh chemicals. Yeah. Those kind mm -hmm. of things. So if braiding hair is not that, then it probably shouldn't have that big of a requirement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we shouldn't start like policing the people in their garages and kitchens. Right, right, <laughs> right. But I think that's where it might start to go. Bella, you were going to say something? Yeah, I, I definitely think, I mean, even for someone who's a salon owner or professional, like it, it works in your favor to know how to do all types of hair. <laughs> you know, I think you just set yourself apart by yeah. knowing how to do straight hair, curly mm -hmm. hair, natural hair, whatever. Um, but I also think as well, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a good thing. Um, you know, people are limited now. Like I know back where I grew up in Arkansas, it's, one of those things where you kind of, you know, okay, if I want to go get braids, I need to go to this person. If I want to go get my hair straight, I have to go here. So we're jumping all around in these different spots because no one person just knows how to do everything. <laughs> so I think, you know, definitely trying to get that certification or, you know, know how to do that. It, it works in your favor. Um, but I also see too, a lot of people now are going away again from natural hair. Like it's going back to, I've had friends now go back to relaxers. Um, they're just like, no, I'm, I'm done with the natural hair movement. I'm right back to the, as they call it, creamy crack um, <laughs> that they want to use. So I don't know if that was just, you know, a phase between that early 2000, 2010 mark where people were just like, you know what, we're going to go natural. We're going right. to just embrace our natural hair. Um, but I am seeing people, you know, leave, um, leave, cut their dreads. Um, mm -hmm. I'm seeing people go from, you know, their natural state back to a uh, relaxed state. So I don't know. But why? Why do you think? I think because it was truly a, like a movement. And, you know, some people are so gung-ho to jump on things that they think is, you know, empowerment instead of doing yeah. their research and figuring yeah. out why, what are the best benefits for you besides having relaxed hair uh, and to get, you know, just wear your natural hair. Mm -hmm. um, I think people just saw it as, oh, you know what? I, I want to get locks, um, you know, and they did the locks and now it's like, okay, I'm over it. And they move on to something else. The style. Yeah. The style. Yeah. The style. Yeah. All right. Now in San Francisco, I'm still seeing the opposite. I'm still seeing movement more towards natural. Um, and also there are now some ads that I see around um, the city saying things like, did you wear a relaxer from this year to that year? Call such and such attorney. You may be entitled to blah, blah, blah. If you or one of your descendants has cancer or fibroids or endometriosis or whatever. Um, mm. starting to see that those things go up conversations around how dangerous some of those chemicals can be um, yeah absolutely how harsh they are and how they they might be connected to some of the medical problems that seem to particularly impact black women um black women's bodies so that is that is interesting yeah wow uh, oh, okay. We have from an anonymous attendee to all of us. This is a question for all of us. When you decided to wear your hair natural, uh, did it change your relationships with other Black women? I won't say changed my relationship, but I know my mother was totally against <laughs> it. Yeah. Um, she just thought like, especially with me transitioning from just my natural hair to my locks. Mm -hmm. Oh, she was totally against it. She just thought like, she was like, well, it's going to be hard for you to find a job. It's going to be, you know, very difficult for you to do this and this. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, she was born in, you know, 1950. And so maybe her understanding of what she knows about hair Mm -hmm. has definitely transpired uh, mm -hmm. over the years but yeah she was one of the people that was just like no I don't think you should do it and 
um I don't think any of my friends did that. Typically, I'm one of the ones like the leader. If I start doing something that my friends come along and that's exactly what happened. Some of my friends were just like, okay, I'm going to go natural. And we just kind of supported each other in that way. But no, my mom was the one. She she just liked my hair in a relaxed state. Yeah. And she yeah. liked it straight, long and straight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of, well, generational trauma and fear that comes yeah. with that criticism. Um, I know, yeah, for me, the fear was not just from my mother, but my paternal aunts also. Um, mm. You know, is this just temporary? Um, when are you going to get your hair done? It's it's done. Um, uh, will you be taken as seriously in the boardroom or the meeting room? Will this affect you getting a promotion? I thought you were going to work at such and such, you know, prestigious company. Um, you know, how is this hair going to work for you there? And even down to, are you going to find a, a mate? Um, I mean, yeah, even that, even that. Um, wow. And unfortunately in the book, there are several essays where this happened um, to people. And the one woman, uh, her mother or her grandmother told her outright, there's no way you're going to find a um, uh, a husband with you wearing your hair in that natural state you need to go back to the relaxer and there's another woman in the book uh, afro-latina and when she was graduating from college her mother showed up with a wig for her to wear over her natural hair and she didn't want to wear that and the mother said the only way we're paying for graduation pictures which are not cheap is if you wear this wig and so they did two full sets of graduation photos, one with the wig and then one with her wearing her hair natural. And the wig ones, they sent to the elders. So like the grandparents and the older generation got the wig pictures and everybody else got the natural hair pictures. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's, it was traumatizing for her. I mean, this is her mom doing that and did not at all like the fact that she went natural and obviously didn't think it was beautiful much less you know professional acceptable or fitting for graduation photos um there are a couple of of stories like that in in the book unfortunately um and most of the black women the question is did it change your relationships unfortunately a lot of them are intrafamilial hmm. so. i actually have a much more uplifting story okay <laughs> okay um First of all, my sister did her, my sister got hers first before. Okay. My, so my family totally didn't have a problem with it. But um, my mother had this friend, friend that all my life, my mother was telling me, you're just like her. You have these feminist ideas. <laughs> and I had read this book, The Second Sex, that was in my mother's attic that had been given to her by this mm -hmm. woman who and she, my mother didn't read it. She was disturbed by the second sex. And I, of course, loved it. And then she told me all my life, you're just like Sylvia. Sylvia didn't wear a bra when all the feminists weren't wearing a bra. She wore in her natural <laughs> hair. Even before other people were wearing Afro, she was wearing natural uh -huh. hair. And, um, and then later I heard this woman, Sylvia, died. And just last year, I looked up who this was. Yes. And she was the first tenured black woman at Yale and her she had been just a feminist uh -huh. natural, mother, natural look she she uh wrote a book about uh beauty standards in different cultures in Africa and okay. she was just a well-known person so I have I had this little seed the seed was planted in my mother's brain <laughs> before it ever came came to me so Wait, I want the the title of that book. What is it? Her name is... Um, and her name is Sophia? Her name is Sylvia Arden Boone. Oh. Sylvia Arden Boone? Yeah. Sylvia Arden Boone. And you, yeah, you can look her up on... Okay. Media. Okay. And, yeah. I'll do that. And she wrote a book of books about, uh, oh, it's called, the book is called Radiance from the Waters, Ideals of Feminine Beauty in Mendy Art. Wow. Okay. Interesting. 
Um, oh, somebody put it in the chat. Um, Liberty. Oh, Liberty is on it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I didn't even spell Arden correctly. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. A comment or question from Tiff. There are so many people that aren't accepting of their natural textures or the tightness of the curls and jerry curls are back in action. Are they? I hope not. <laughs> um, being called curl reformer services. Do you think this may be due to the discrimination created within a race, the looser curls versus the tighter curls, so to speak? Oh, wow. I haven't seen anything like that over here. I hope it's not coming back. Um, I mean, I have scars <laughs> from the Jerry Curl era, um, psychic scars from wearing that. Uh -huh. um, I don't think I've seen any. I I've haven't seen, seen any here. <laughs> wow. Um, I don't know where Tiff is from. Um, I have not seen any, and I hope it's not coming back. I mean, why? Why would you want to go back to that? such a mess and um it's just a a nightmare just maintaining it and the smelly um potions you have to put on it it's got to be kept moist and then you've got to wear it on your head at <laughs> night you can't lay your head anywhere no one can run their fingers through your hair i'm talking about like a significant other cannot do that without having to go and wash their hand afterwards um <laughs> Gosh, I hope it's not coming back. I have not seen it. Mm -hmm. But I think to, to answer the question, it's definitely due, yeah, it, it's due to the colorism that is put on us. Um, I know a lot of times within our culture, we we do say, you know, you got good hair or bad yeah. hair. And, and I don't know if you watched the video that um, Chris Rock did a few years ago. Yes, yes. <laughs> But that was one of, the, I mean, this stems all the way back into like early slavery. Um, yeah. And that's how, you know, yeah. the the slaves with good hair got to be inside. The mm -hmm. ones with bad hair were put outside. Yep. Um, yep. They were doing all these different, I don't know if you all have heard of the pencil test, but yes. you take a pencil and run it yes. through your hair. If it stayed or stuck, you know, you, you had bad hair uh, or yeah. what they deemed as bad black hair. And mm -hmm. if the pencil failed, then, oh, you had nice, loose. Yep. So it is something that, you know, has to do with colorism that was started yep. years ago by white slave owners that just has kind of trickled down into our society um, today um, because it's it's one of those things we do. We we tend to look at somebody's hair and if they have more coals than we do, we automatically assume it's nappy or it's just not good hair Yep. Uh, compared to someone, you know, that might have looser curls as, as you've stated that those are looked favorably for uh -huh. so um yeah it's, it's definitely you know discrimination that's created within our our race mm -hmm. and i'm glad to hear you bring up uh, colorism because there was a pencil test and then also the paper uh the brown paper bag test as well mm, yeah. if you wanted to get into certain parties or certain private societies or sororities you had to pass both pencil mm -hmm. test and the the paper bag test. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Barbara? Oh. Was I looking like I was going to say something? Uh, oh, yeah. I thought you wanted to answer the question about the looser curl versus the tighter curls. Oh, um, maybe I was thinking... I just remember that essay that was in the New York Times by that woman who said... Um, she said, I have rape colored skin. Do you remember that? She opened, that was the way she opened it. I have rape colored skin. Oh, who wrote that? I forget her name. She's She was on MSNBC all the time. And she she was actually the great granddaughter of the Pettis, who the Pettis Bridge was named for. And she's, um, but she, so this idea of having, you know, why were the people with the straight hair allowed to be in the house well they were allowed to be in the house maybe because they were the genetically related <laughs> to the masters okay i see it it says um oh it's 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 paywalled but it looks like it's in the new york times and it said you want a confederate monument my body is uh and uh, i can't can't read the rest is that it 
Yeah, I think that's it. But so the the whole colorism, you know, has a double edge there. Um. Oh, here it is. You want a Confederate monument? My body is a Confederate monument. Um. Where's the author? Carolyn Randall Williams. Yeah. Caroline w Randall Williams. I have raped colored skin. My light brown blackness is a living testimony to the rules, the practices, the causes of the old self. If there are those who want to remember the legacy of the Confederacy, if they want monument, well then my body is a monument, my skin is a monument. Interesting. Hmm. Um, I wanted to share, I was telling the story about the graduation pictures um, from Dama Yanis Figueroa's um, essay, and I wanted to share that, if I can find it. Oh, oh, here's another good one, too. Um, so here's one. She was coming back from uh, her first semester at college. It was her first time coming back home and she's waiting in Grand Central. Uh, she's gotten off the train and her mother is looking for her in the waiting room. Uh, let's see, she had dressed up just to come and pick me up. Her efforts to look her best and the worried look on her face warmed my heart and I got teary eyed. She paced up and down in front of me, heels clicking, apprehension written all over her face as she searched the crowd for her daughter. Mom, mommy, here, I'm right here. I waved, got up, and opened my arms to her. It took her a moment, but she finally focused on my face. Confusion, followed by recognition and then horror, registered. Ay, Dios mio. I had forgotten that I had changed a bit since she'd last seen me. She had proudly sent off a daughter who was her version of a college co-ed, complete with kilt skirts, white blouses, penny loafers, bangs, and a properly brushed head of silky hair. What stood before her now was an army booted, fatigue wearing radical with wire rim spectacles and a thriving Afro. I probably looked like a Puerto Rican Angela Davis in her eyes. Recognition was quickly followed by my mother's hand snaking into her handbag, retrieving her ever-present silk scarf. She tried to cover my hair right then and there. Tomorrow we're going to Gloria's. That was the salon. Pushing her hands away, I was hurt. It's nice to see you too, mom. And that's when and how our hair wars began. Who was this angry and outspoken rebel with atrocious clothes and wild hair? So this is the same essay where she speaks about the grad to two sets of graduation pictures later. Um, and, you know, of course, the, the same mother who hadn't come any further along in her understanding um, four years later at her at her graduation. Uh, let's see. Other questions? The last thing in the answer, she shared a link um, about the Jerry Curls. <laughs> it was an oh, article really? done that they are on the comeback. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Wait, why can't I see it? Oh, I can't see it. Go to answer. Oh, uh, here it is from Leah. Yes. Okay. Why on earth? Wow. Um, you know, maybe it's not as damaging as having a relaxer, but um, wow. And of course, they have a picture of Lionel and Michael there. Um, yep, they speak about Comer Cottrell. Mm -hmm. He's the one who came up with the original curl kit for um for white folks, and then uh. Uh, or no, Redding did. Redding did that. And then Coma Cottrell is the one who adapted it for the Black community. Um, oh, Liberty, I see you here. 
Is it that time? We are closing in on our 90 minute mark. Okay. And I don't want to hustle everybody off or anything, um, but wanted to make sure y'all knew and maybe do a final round of thoughts. Um, this has been a great conversation. Yeah, uh, I think we've we've y'all y'all dove in and answered all of our Q and A prompts. Yes, um, yes, we did. Uh, so I think um, I think it's kind of up to y'all how you want to send us off. Um, and I, I do really hope that folks will pick up this book. Uh, there's so many stories and insights here that obviously we have only scratched the surface of tonight. Yep, uh, there's about twenty three stories in here, um, all true stories. And the book is divided into four sections. So um, first section is called A Critical Lens, which has some academics writing about the whole natural hair history from an academic lens. Then there's The Pilgrimage, which as that section's title suggests, is about people who made the journey uh, from a laxer or um, hot combing to just wearing their hair natural. Part three is intimate encounters, and those are stories um, about intrafamilial conflicts uh, with people going natural, especially among Afro-Latina women, because they have an extra layer of complexity to this whole um, hair situation. And then the Unshackled Chronicles, which is a um, story about people feeling that they're freeing themselves um, by deciding to, to go natural and a reading reader discussion guide and a resource guide in the back. So uh, again, I do want to invite you, um, if you write about this topic or have a presentation about this topic um, or wanna create one and you're interested in presenting at the conference this summer, it's virtual. Um, it's August 9th through the 11th. The call for paper is in the chat. Liberty put it there under, um, under, where is it? Call for papers, there it is. Um, and then you can also contact me through my website, which is also in the chat um, to discuss the conference or um, just to ask any other questions about writing in general. Um, I do teach creative writing workshops and professional development workshops for writers. And I still teach many of them virtually. Um, I had to make that pivot during a pandemic like everybody did. And I still teach uh, a lot of virtual mm -hmm. classes as well. You can find those workshops on my website um, also. And uh, Barbara and Valerie, do you want to do a closing remark? And talk about, you haven't either of you really talked about what you're doing. like. Barbara, you I, haven't spoken about your own work. Um, my main focus project right now is, um, well, I'm working on a poetry chat book. I've, I'm committed to getting one of those out this year because I haven't done that yet. And then I'm working on a memoir about following the Grateful Dead. It's called Dead Dreams is the tentative title. Mm -hmm. And I uh, performed an excerpt at the Marsh in Berkeley. So I did a solo performance. Oh! Monolog adapted from the um, from the memoir. Oh, all right. I didn't know that. Good. Okay. That's and about well, right now I am in my last year of my doctoral studies, um, and I'm actually in the process of writing my dissertation now. Uh, I have a few more things that I have to finish up, and hopefully by July, I have sealed the deal to be doctor. So. Doctorate in what? Uh, law and policy at Northeastern. Okay. Oh, you can help us get a National Crown Act passed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I, I'm focused more so on the policy side than. Yep. You know, okay. Anything, so. But yes, <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> Y'all, it's been such a pleasure. Um, thanks to everybody who joined in and submitted such thoughtful questions. Um, I know that we will all uh, look forward to catching more of your work, um, whether that's uh, future future events online or uh, more more written works. Um, thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you, and we're jumping into the other chat with you, right? Okay. Yep. Thank you for coming, right. everyone.
Thank you. Take care. Good night, folks.